Hi, I'm Tom Short, and you may know me, you may not, but this is my initial podcast. I've been asked a number of times by a number of people through the last couple of years, Tom, you ought to do a podcast. I write a daily email, and more and more people have been saying that they'd rather hear me and listen than read my emails, and so they've asked if I would do that, and I've finally, during this pandemic, have agreed to go ahead and do so. Um, but when you start a podcast, there's two big questions you got to address. Number one, all the technical aspects, and we've been working on that to try and get this to, to sound well, look well, and so forth. Hopefully, we'll do okay there. But secondly is the content, and what are you actually going to talk about? And so I've gone back and forth on so many different um, ideas of what I'd like to communicate, and I thought that today I'd just begin by introducing myself and talking a little bit about what you can expect in future podcasts from this, uh, from this channel. Um, so I began, as you've probably known me, I've preached on campuses for 40 years, more or less, with a few times off. We're now in the midst of, of this pandemic and the shutdown here from the COVID crisis, and I'm not out on campuses, and I figured this will accelerate this effort to actually begin speaking online and doing more of an online activity. But the way I got started on campus was years ago. I was at the University of Maryland. We were planting a church. It was 1979-1980, the school year. And we had gone out from the Ohio State University where we had planted, where we'd come from a church there. And we were going to plant a church at uh, College Park, the University of Maryland. And we found out people were not as open as we thought. They were, they were far more resistant to the gospel. And it was quite a discouraging effort to try and reach people with the gospel. During that time, the Lord led us to try and do some things to make, to raise the spiritual interest, the spiritual level of, of activity, the spiritual level of discussion on the campus. And one of the things we began to do was to preach publicly out in front of the Hornbake Library in the plaza there. And people listened. They would listen, and, and three hours every day I'd be out there preaching, and there would be crowds of people listening. Before we knew it, people were coming to Christ. People were getting saved. They are being baptized. God was raising up a group, an army of fervent disciples for Jesus Christ. One of my methods when I was preaching was to take questions. And I discovered early on that people aren't so much interested in a preaching as they are in questions. And it didn't take long during those questions to discover what were the opposition, what were the obstacles to people believing in Christ, what were the questions people were asking, what were the things skeptics were saying to keep people from the gospel. Through the years, when, well, when I first started, all I was doing was preaching the gospel. But through the years, my ministry has really morphed to being one of speaking, giving reasons, and helping people think through why we believe what we believe. And what does Christianity really teach? What is our doctrine? What is the right understanding of a Christian worldview, a Christian perspective on life? I'd like to, as I think about that, this is what I'd like to talk about during my podcast. I'd like to talk about a Christian perspective. I've come to believe that the Christian way of life is vastly superior to anything the world offers. What we have is superior to the secular worldview. It's superior to the sexual revolution. It's superior to the hedonistic, the view of, of just living for pleasure. It's superior to a materialistic point of view. It's, it's superior to scientism, the belief science has the answer to everything. That Christianity is superior to any other perspective, any other way of life you could ever have. And so during this time, I plan to be talking about every aspect of life. I plan to talk about our personal walk with God. I plan to talk about our church life, our relationship life. I'm sure we'll talk about marriages. I've been married now 43 years. We'll talk about child raising as we've raised five children and now have 10 and, and, and two new ones have come in. So 12 grandchildren into our family. Uh, we, we'll talk about money and how to get along in this world. What are God's principles for money? We'll talk about things that relate to health. We'll talk about things that relate to being in physical shape, biblically. 
We'll talk about things related to um, uh, government and politics. We'll talk about things related to current events. We'll talk about things related to business. We'll talk about we'll talk about things relating to entertainment. We'll talk about anything really that's on my mind as relates to following Christ. And that's the key point. What's not, what relates to following Christ? I've come to believe that that the that Jesus and his life for us is far broader than when I first became a Christian. Initially, I just thought Christianity all it really had to deal with was was my God had a plan for my life and he'd saved me and I wanted to follow Jesus and I wanted to live and be a person like Jesus wanted me to be. But in time, that vision of what God has a plan for and dare I say what our spiritual enemy Satan has a plan to undermine that vision of understanding grew and grew and grew. It grew to embrace my understanding of what the church would be, that God had a plan for the church, but so did Satan. When I got married, it grew to, and I was considering marriage, it grew to understand, it grew to uh, include what's God's plan for how people find a spouse? What's God's plan for what a marriage should be like? How a marriage ought to operate? How a marriage ought to succeed? And through the years, we've learned so many, many things. And I want to be sharing throughout these different podcasts things that I believe will help you have a better marriage that Roz and I have learned through our years of following Scripture and putting Christ first. Child raising. I began to see God has a plan for child raising. I began to see God has a plan. God has a plan for everything. What's your vision of God? Do you picture a God who, who all he cares about is, is your personal private life and your church life, but he doesn't really care about how you live in your home, how you conduct yourself as a citizen, how you ap- operate at work? What do you view? How do you view God? I view God as all-encompassing. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. His kingdom is expanding further and further and further. And so we want to address these things, all kinds of things. And I hope to, I hope to be interesting. And indeed, I recall a a, a fellow at Virginia Tech University years ago, and I barely started preaching and he, and he, he had a question for me and I took his question and, uh, and he, he sat there and he listened to the answer. He's a senior in physics and he listened to me for all afternoon. At the end of the day, towards the end of the day, I asked him, I I said, you know, I've answered your questions. I've got a question for you. You're an atheist. How did you become an atheist? I asked. He was 22 years old, and he told me when I was 14, I was sitting in church. I looked around, and I realized, I don't believe this. I don't think anyone else here does either. He said, I walked out of church that day, and I've never walked, I've never been back in since. I said, wait a minute. You don't believe in God. You haven't been in church in eight years, and you stood out here and you listened to me the last five hours? And his answer was, well, you're interesting. I'm interesting because because God is interesting. I'm interesting because I'll address life as if Jesus is Lord in every aspect. I'm interesting because I have thought through what does it really mean to follow Christ in every single area of life. That's why what I share will be interesting, and that's what I hope this podcast will be. I hope it'll be interesting to you. Well, I want to start today by discussing a little bit of a broader picture that's important to me. And it comes from the book of Jeremiah and and chapter 39. And this is a time when uh, Israel was under attack by the Babylonians. And Jeremiah saw coming, and he describes in chapter 39 what happens. And I'll begin reading here, verse 1. Now, when Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. Laying siege means they surround the country. It means that they surround the city. Uh, No water in, no food in, no commerce in, no one in, no one out. Basically, they're going to starve them to death. 
In the 11th year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. Now, this is important because in the ancient times, cities would be protected by a wall. The wall kept the bad people out. And if you've ever seen an ancient city or an ancient castle, you might be startled at the walls. There was a time a number of years ago when I was, I was traveling, and, and three Saturdays in a row I visited castles. The first Saturday we were in London. We visited the Tower of London. And we saw the walls surrounding this castle, the, the Tower of London. The next week I was in Italy. And once again, on Saturday, we, we visited a castle. And my goodness, it was up on top of a hill. The walls were 30, 40 feet high. Uh, it, it was amazing. How in the world did they build that, those walls? How did they get those big rocks that high? I mean, we're talking about big rocks building that wall. How much labor, how much work, how much effort must have been going into building those walls? And I remember pointing that out to my wife and saying, wow, I mean, just imagine all the manpower, all the labor. How many people died building those walls around that castle? And my wife pointed out to me, she said, Tom, they didn't have an option because when the enemies came to attack you, those walls would make the difference between whether or not you'd survive. No walls, you're sitting duck for the enemy to come and attack you. But those walls enabled them to be safe and secure. Wow. Suddenly those walls made sense. And I began to understand even in the Old Testament, the, effort, the emphasis on building walls around the city, around the castle. The next Saturday I was in, in, uh, in, in India, in Nizamabad, India, where I saw yet a third castle up on a hill, again with Big, strong, powerful walls surrounding it. There was great effort put into building the walls. There was great effort put into surrounding and protecting the city from the enemy. And here in Jeremiah 39, we see that there was a wall around Jerusalem designed to protect Jerusalem from its enemies. But King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had laid siege to the city and they were, they were attacking the city. And here in the 11th year, the fourth month, the ninth day, the city wall was breached. The city wall, was, there was a, a breach in the wall, meaning a, a, a break in the wall. They finally had broken down so that the wall no longer held out the enemy. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon, verse 3, came in and sat down in the middle gate. And we get, we're given the names of several. I'm not going to try and read them. They're hard to pronounce. But you can see these officials as if they just strutted into Jerusalem. And now the wall was broken. The wall was breached. They would just strut in there and then just sit down in the middle gate as if they're saying, this land is now ours. We've conquered. We breached the wall. And now the wall is down. There's no stopping the enemy from penetrating and destroying Israel. Well, verse 4, then Nebuchadnezzar, or excuse me, then Zedekiah, the king of Judah, or the, king, the, the good king here, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them. When they saw them, they fled and went out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls. And he went out toward the Arabah. They knew they were toast. They knew, they, were, they knew it was over. There was no stopping the Babylonians now that they'd breached the wall. And so they fled. The king fled. His army fled. All his generals fled. His family fled. They ran for their life. They snuck out and they were gone. But the army of the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And they seized him and brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah in the land of Hamath. And he passed sentence on him. And so here the king of Judah, 
was captured. The nobles, his family, they were all captured. They were brought back before the attacking, conquering king, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 6, Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. Can you imagine? The king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah. Can you imagine that? Here's the king, King Zedekiah. And they capture him and all his family and all the nobles. And, and when he's brought back before the conquering king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, they slay his wife, they slay his children right before his eyes. They slay all his nobles, all his counselors, all his leaders right before his eyes. How brutal, how cruel, how, how terrible would that have been? Have you ever seen someone die? Have you ever seen someone where you watch them die right before your eyes? And here Zedekiah has to watch and observe the killing, the murder, the slaying. It was probably brutal. It wasn't nice. It would have been bloody. The slaying of his own children, the slaying of his, of his family, the slaying of his nobles and counselors. Right before his eyes. How brutal. But look at what happened next, verse 7. Then he blinded Zedekiah's eyes. What'd they do? I don't know. I don't know if they put, you know, burnt, burnt his eyes, if they, if they gouged him out. But somehow they blinded him. The last thing he ever saw was the, the, the killing, the slaying of everyone important in his life. His family and his nobles. That was his last vision, and then they blinded him, plucked out his eyes or something. They bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. The Chaldean, they humiliated him. The Chaldeans also burned with fire the king's palace and the houses of the people, and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Not just a breach, but all the walls, so that now Jerusalem was defenseless. I have a question for you. Zedekiah, the people of Judah, had an enemy in Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, king of Babylon. How they treated him, when he, how, what they did to Zedekiah, to me, is inhumane. It's brutal. It's, it's disgusting. It's, it's beyond what you could even imagine. That type of slaying, blinding, binding. It must have just been beyond what anything you could ever imagine, gruesome, ugly, terrible. But I have a question. We have a spiritual enemy. His name is Satan, the adversary of God. And I want to ask you, do you think he's any less brutal than Nebuchadnezzar was? Do you think Satan is any less cruel than Nebuchadnezzar was? I'm sometimes asked, you know, I've been asked, you know, we're supposed to love our enemies. Should we love Satan? Should we be kind, compassionate, understanding of Satan? No, 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 no. He's our more, he's, he's not a your enemy. He's the enemy of God. The reason he hates you is because he hates God and you're made in God's image and you remind him of God. The reason he hates you is because he hates God and he knows God loves you and he knows he can't touch God, but he can touch someone who God loves. He can touch someone who God cares about. He can touch you. He can get to you. He can get to me. He can't get to God. And so we have this, this spiritual enemy, Satan, cruel, wicked, evil, destructive, far, far worse than Nebuchadnezzar was. In our modern day, far worse than any brutal thing you've ever seen in a movie, far worse than any beheading you've ever seen by the former ISIS group. We better take him seriously. We better take him seriously. Now, the problem then, we, you know, we don't build walls in our days. I, I realize it's a political slogan. I realize people, you know, building a wall on our southern border, things like this. But we don't have wall, you know, we have, might have a security system. You have a lock on your door. You might even live in a gated community. But by and large, we don't think of walls in quite the same way they did. And our enemy doesn't attack us in quite the same way Nebuchadnezzar attacked. 
And indeed, while you and I certainly could be physically attacked, we certainly could be uh, brutalized physically by someone, the, the greater challenge in our day is that our enemy attacks us, Satan, our adversary, attacks us in a different way. And how he attacks us is by what, he, by what we will believe. His primary tactic is he is a deceiver. We read in Revelation 12 that Satan deceives the whole world. We read in John 8, verse 44, Jesus said to the Pharisees, You're of the father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he's a liar. He does not stay in the truth because there's no truth in him. Your spiritual enemy's primary means of attack upon you will be to lie to you. This is why it's so important where Jesus said in John 8, verses 31 and 32, he spoke to his disciples and he said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, what do you mean? I mean, I mean, if, if you're in chains, you want the chains broken, that, that, that would set you free. Or if you're in bondage, you'd want the bondage broken, that sets you free. Jesus said what, what it, the bondage we experience the change we experience, the slavery we experience, is when we have believed the evil one. We have believed his lies. We've accepted things that are not true. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he said, he was, he, he said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the lie. Life, excuse me, the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 1, we read that the law came through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 18, Jesus said he came to bear witness to the truth. I've, I've often made the statement that, contrary to what many of us say, Christianity is not based on faith. Christianity is based on truth. If you believe the truth about Jesus Christ, then those truths will benefit you. First of all, of course, unto salvation. But then secondly, the more you believe of the truths of Jesus Christ and the truths of God, the more victorious, the more wonderful, the more good, the more, the more uh, advantageous your life will be, the more success you will have in the eyes of God, as he promised in Psalm 1, that the one who meditates on the word of God, so that he's careful to do what it says, will be like a tree planted by streams of water, yield its fruit in the season, its leaf will not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Why? Because whoever lives the truths of God in life prospers, true prosperity. Real, not as the world says, but true prosperity. A wealth of relationships, a wealth of joy, a wealth of satisfaction, a wealth of, sometimes a wealth of money, of health, sometimes not. But generally speaking, where as we more and more of God's truth in our life, less and less of Satan's lies, and the more, the more full our life will be, the more we'll know the, the blessing of God, the, that He surrounds us with His goodness, and His loving kindness endures forever and ever and ever. That's the life we want to be living. Now, there's this, the Bible says of Satan that he... G, G, the Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, verse 10, he came to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And we must always realize that we face this, this enemy who wants to steal from us. He wants to steal our joy. He wants to steal our victory. He wants to destroy our walk with God. He wants to destroy our families, destroy our relationships, destroy our health, destroy our wealth. He wants to kill us. He wants to see you dead. He'd like to see you commit suicide. 
He'd like to see every, he wants to, he's just a destroyer. He's a, he, he tears down. And God is a builder. Jesus Christ is a builder. Jesus Christ is one who wants to give and fill, and fill us up so that we are like that tree that yields its, by the stream of water, that yields great fruit in its season. And so we live in a time where, well, so Satan, our great enemy, but this is what, this is an important thing. How do we protect ourselves from, how did, how did Judah protect itself from the Babylonians, the king of Chaldea, the Chaldeans? They built a wall, a physical wall around their city. But our great enemy wants to attack us in what we believe, what we know, what we think. Our religion, Christianity, is built on truth, and he wants to undermine the truths upon which our faith is built. And he wants to undermine the truths of all of life. If we realize that God isn't just a, you know, it's just not a personal thing, it's so much more, it's all of life, the whole earth that's full of the loving kindness of God. And so Satan will want to attack all of this. Now, here's the thing. We live in quite a time. We live in what's known as the information age. And it's pretty awesome, as you know. If you, you know, if, if I, I can remember the time before there was an internet. I can remember a time when we had encyclopedias. We got things out of books and newspapers. I remember a time there wasn't, there, there was not nearly the access to information we have now. And I am so grateful for all the ability. And so many, if you have a question, you know, you just pull out your phone, and you find the answer. You have a disagreement, you can find the answer within seconds because we have all of this information at our fingertips. But here's the problem. There's no vetting of information anymore. There's no walls put up to prevent the evil one from giving us an onslaught of information. And indeed, while we have access to more information than ever before, and it's wonderful, and in this information age, we are we're solving problems, we're, we're curing diseases, we're, we're, we're educating the world, we're doing so many wonderful things with access to information. But because it's not, there's no way of vetting it, we're also being challenged with and an onslaught of false information. And if you don't believe this, you're terribly naive. You'd be terribly naive. Because our enemy's primary means of attack is through lying to us, through false information. And so if you have the false, and so, so if you don't think he's trying to influence us through modern communication, through social media, through the internet, through websites, through movies, through all of these wonderful things we have. But if you don't think, if you're not discerning and don't think he's trying to influence us, you're terribly naive. And so what, am I, what, is, what would I urge you and I to do? What must we do? We must realize that there is a battle between God and Satan, and you and I are the battleground. God speaks truth to us, truth that can set us free. Satan lies to us and deceives us. And you and I are the battleground, the truth giver, the great deceiver. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Do you realize you're the battleground? We see it in, in the basic salvation message, don't we? Satan gives us all kinds of ways. If you do this, you'll get to heaven. If you do, you're not that bad. You don't, you know, you don't need really all religions are the same. He lies and lies and lies and lies. And against that, we have the truth of Jesus Christ. Is that I'm the way. He who believes in me has eternal life. I offer myself. I lay down my life for the sheep. And this is the first place we see this conflict in the very na- very aspect. How does a person get to heaven? But we see it everywhere. In, in the Garden of, of Eden. What was the very first sin? How did it happen? God had revealed himself to them, but Satan came and lied and said, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God knows if you eat of that tree, 
the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be just like God. And he's holding, he's holding out on you. He lied about God. And Eve had a choice to make. Do I believe what God said or do I believe what Satan said, the serpent? Adam had a choice to make. All throughout history, you and I, oh, we all have a choice to make. Who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe the Word of God? Am I going to stand on the Word of God? Am I going to, am I going to search for the truth? Now, no one's going to, none of us are going to say, no, I'd rather believe Satan. But understand, he's a deceiver. Understand, he's tricky. He's, 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 he's the best liar out there. Have you ever been ripped off by a salesman? Have you ever been tricked or lied to by a salesman? I have. I have. And let me tell you, the most lying, deceitful con artist on this planet can't hold a candle to Satan when it comes to trickery, deception, and lying. We must have our guard up. We must be careful because no one's vetting this for us anymore. No one's vetting this information. We've got to be careful. Now, when we think of this information uh, revolution that comes and the walls being built down, you know, I, there's a number of things I want to just mention briefly. False religions. False teachers. We're warned in Scripture to beware of false teachers. As a matter of fact, it's one of the greatest warnings over and over again in Scripture. Beware of false teachers. We're warned in the last days there would there'd be a proliferation of deceivers, false teachers, false prophets. Do you know who the false teachers are in our day? We get all upset and worried about some cult group without realizing sometimes the false teachers are the teachers in the classrooms. The teachers who are teaching us uh, information in, in the university classroom or the high school classroom. Sometimes the false prophets that people are listening to are the people singing, to, singing music to us or producing our, our movies. Sometimes the false tempters that, 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 that come against us because the walls are broken down through the internet and so forth is the pornography and the access to, to uh, filthy things online or on, on cable or wherever. And all these things wage war against our mind and against our soul. And if you are not careful to build the walls of protection in your own life, then you will be like Zedekiah when the wall was breached and, and the, the Chaldeans came in and they plundered them. And more and more in our day and age, we're seeing Christians being plundered. We're seeing even Christian leaders being defeated by sexual temptation. Christian leaders and music leaders, worship leaders, being uh, walking away from the faith because of Basic apologetic questions that I get asked by skeptics and I've been asked for 40 years and I've had to answer out, out while preaching the gospel. And somehow these people have fallen for false lines of the skeptics and they've walked away. We're seeing people that are being deceived by a secularist worldview, even a Marxist worldview. And Marxism has been since its inception and the days of Karl Marx, who, who, who hated the church, who hated religion, and everywhere Mar where Marxism has gone and its narrative of life and, of, uh, and of, of history has been a, its number one opponent is not capitalism. The number one opponent of Marxism is Christianity. And this is, and Marxism seeks to destroy Christianity. And we're seeing young people, Christian people, who are walking away from the faith of Jesus Christ because they've been deceived by the, the hope, the allure of Marxism and socialism. Not real. And some of them at first thought, oh, this is a Christian thing. Look, the early church was socialist. And before they know it, they have bought, they, they bought into this philosophy hook, line, and sinker and are walking away from the faith of Jesus Christ, having been seduced by this satanic idea of Marxism. And one of these future podcasts, we'll talk about how satanic Marxism and Karl Marx actually was. And I am guarantee you, when we talk about Karl Marx, there's things you will learn about him 
that you had no idea how evil this man really was. So we live in this time. You live in this time. We can't help it. And we best not be naive and we best not walk around with our walls breached where the enemy has access to our heart and our mind to lie to us, to deceive us, to tempt us, to trick us. Brothers and sisters, we're seeing way too many Christian leaders, way too many Christian worship leaders, way too many Christian young people walking away from the faith. The walls have been broken down. And then we understand a little bit about what Nebuchadnezzar, or excuse me, what Nehemiah must have been thinking. Because Nehemiah was, was, was away in, during this time of this Babylon, of the, uh, the, the captivity. And some people came to where he was, and they talked to him about what had happened. And it said, they said to him, the, the remnant in the province, here's Nehemiah 1 verse 3, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress, distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. The wall's broken down. The people are in distress. The enemy has access to them. They, they, there's no defense left. Nehemiah's response, chapter 1, verse 4, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Wow. Why did Nehemiah sit down and weep and pray and mourn? Because the walls were broken down. There was no protection for the people of God anymore. And I believe as we look at the world in which we live today, the walls in this information age, in the access to what we think and believe and what we what, what's on our mind, uh, the information we receive, our walls have been broken down. I pray that God will raise up many people like Nehemiah who can rebuild the walls. And when I say this, by the way, I don't mean that we wall ourselves off from unbelievers, that we build walls between those who disagree with us. But the walls to def that defend us from false teaching, from false ideas, from false information, from temptation. The, 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 the church in our day seems to be defeated, neglected, worn out, beaten up. And like, it's like we're laying by the roadside with so many, with no one to raise us up, no one to come and and, and build the walls of protection. And so, so many of God's children, the bride of Christ, day in and day out, are just defeated. Defeated. And I pray that that won't happen. I pray God will raise up a mighty, mighty church of God where we walk in the victory that is promised in the Bible, that we think in faith, that we become the people of God, that we... we we demonstrate that this life of which we speak is real, it works, and it's far superior to anything else the world could offer us. I pray that for you. I think this will be the focus of so many of the messages I give here online and that I hope you will listen to. As I said, we're, th this, is, this relates to salvation, God's truth. How do I walk in victory? How do I break the chains? personal temptation, how do I walk in, in joy and victory and personal spiritual success with God? It has to do with everything, though. Your money, your health, your family, your relationships, your wife, your kids, your personal life, your public life, your, 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 our culture, our entertainment, our government, our worldview, our purpose, everything. The more, the, more you, the more areas you identify of truths that you believe or of information you believe 
that you can say, wait a minute, God says this, and I have been believing that. Why did I believe the wrong thing? Where did that come from? The more areas in life that you can identify God's truth and bring your thinking and your life into submission to God's truths, the more victorious, successful, joyful, loving, powerful person you will be in God. And so I hope to, I hope to, over the coming period of time, I hope to speak in a, a multitude of issues. I hope you'll be joining me. I hope you'll pass this around, help your friends be joining as well. And, uh, and by the way, if there's things you want me to talk about, by all means, contact me. You can find me, uh, my website, tomthepreacher.com. You can email me at tom at tomthepreacher.com. You can find me on my YouTube channel at, at uh, YouTube backslash Tom the Preacher. Three words, Tom the Preacher, and I'll, I'll come up. You can find me. There's all kinds of ways to contact me and uh, so forth. And, and, of course, we'll post this as a podcast. Folks, we're in a battle. Whether you like it or not, we are. And you are the battleground. Your soul is the battleground. Your mind is the battleground. Your heart is the battleground. I pray to God for you, for me, for my family, for my wife, kids, grandkids, my church, my friends. I pray for my country. I pray for this world that everywhere we go, the kingdom, uh, the, the kingship of God, the lordship of Christ, the truths of Jesus Christ might have more and fuller and fuller sway in our lives. God bless you. Be in the Word. Be in the Word. Study God's Word. Dedicate yourself. Maybe today after hearing this, you, you say, Lord, I've let the walls break down in my life. Where have I believed that which is not true? Where have I swallowed the deceptions of the enemy of my soul? What things have I embraced that are not true? And maybe you, like I pray you and me, all of us, bring our life more and more. Of course, we do this through God's Word. We do this through godly counsel. We do this by hearing the right people, making sure we don't listen to the wrong ones. God bless you. Thanks for being with us on this initial podcast. Um, Again, I'm Tom Short, and I do hope to be um, communicating with you quite a bit in the future. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for every person who listens into this. Lord, I believe that they, me, all of us are precious to you. We confess and acknowledge our own susceptibility to being deceived by the enemy of our souls. We're no match for him. We're no match. He's smarter. He might even know the Bible better than most of us. But we do have a Savior. And Jesus, we call upon you to save us, to reach out to us, to give us your truth. You said the truth will set us free. You are the truth. Grace and truth comes through you. You came to testify and bear witness to the truth. Oh, let your truth fill our mind and our heart and every part of our being, right down to the innermost part of who we are. We pray for this. We dedicate ourselves freshly to you, to be your followers, your disciples, learners of you, rejecting lies of the evil one, embracing the truth of our Lord and Savior. And Jesus, it's in your name we come and pray this to the Father. Amen.